Good morning, everyone, and welcome to AMOS, your course on Agile Methods and Open Source, brought to you by the Professorship of Open Source at the Friedrich Alexander University Erlangen Nuremberg. Today, we have a very special guest, um, Dirk Stockmann, who is the head of R&D at Siemens Schweiz AG, and who's going to teach us on how to scale Agile methods today. Uh, Mr. Stockmann, a very warm welcome, and the stage is all yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be able to talk here today. Just a small correction, I'm not the R&D head for Siemens Switzerland, I'm the head for the Digital Grid Software Unit. But um, I will explain a little bit more what we actually do in the next couple of slides. And uh, just to mention it, if you have questions, uh, please um, uh, use the raise hands uh, method and then we will answer it um, as uh, quickly as possible, as good as I can. So with that, I think I just get started. So I don't want to speak much about Siemens. I'm sure you know it's a large company, just to give you a little bit of thing, uh, how large it is because that is also a little bit um, uh, why we need to scale Agile, obviously. The part where I'm uh, responsible for the software development organization is called Digital Grid. And we uh, basically deal with um, energy distribution and uh, controlling the energy distribution. And uh, we have quite a number of different portfolios and um, what are our typical customers, uh, for example, um, uh, transmission companies um, or distribution companies, so let's say utilities, for example. So people that are responsible to make sure that you have uh, power, gas and water at home, these are our customers. And there's quite a lot of uh, things happening and software is one of the key, um, uh, let's say, levers to make this uh, changes possible, like um, uh, reducing carbon emissions, uh, also using more renewables without having to invest heavily into, let's say, physical infrastructure, because uh, if you don't have software to control it, you would have to invest a lot of money into uh, very expensive hardware, which would take a long time also. Exactly. So, Let's come to the real topic of the um, talk, um, how to scale agile methods. And I mean, the first question is obviously, is this even a good idea? Why would you like to scale um, agile software development? Uh, where at the, let's say, initial idea of um, agile, um, when you look at the agile manifesto or, or other practices, there's the idea to remove hierarchies, have uh, direct communication, everything as direct and small and fast as possible. I mean, scaling probably does not help with it. We will see um, that it um, makes things obviously more complicated again. So why would you do it uh, when the world uh, seems to be much better without it? And the reason is uh, kind of obvious, but I still want to point it out. Um, just here, some examples you can find on the net, how large uh, software systems are typically these days. When I look at the software that I have in my portfolio or that other Siemens businesses have in their portfolio, um, these software packages, um, if they are not kind of uh, trivial, are typically between 500,000 lines of code and 50 million lines of code. I know lines of code is a terrible measure uh, for the uh, size or complexity of a software system. Unfortunately, um, there are uh, many other measurements like um, uh, complex, uh, complexity and so on, but none of them is really much better in the end to describe the effort. So I stick with this um, bad measurement. Um, at least it gives me some way to compare topics. And now the issue is that when you look at, um, uh, let's say, complex piece of software, there are many studies and they always come up with results, let's say, between 
maybe 300 uh, and 1000 lines of code that a developer can write per month in uh, production quality. So with debugging, testing, documentation, the developer can uh, write between, let's say, 300 and 1000 lines of code per month, which basically gives us uh, in an average 500 just to have uh, something to calculate. Uh, and then we end up with 6,000 lines of code per year. So if you want to write a software that has 1 million lines of code, which would be still on the lower limit of what typical industrial software products have, the developer would need 166 years. Uh, as you can imagine, most customers don't want to wait 166 years. Now you say, okay, we have uh, Agile, we have Scrum teams. Um, let's say you have 10 developers in a Scrum team, which is already on the larger side of a Scrum team to have so many productive developers. It still takes about 17 years. So obviously uh, this is not going to work and you need to scale your development organization to be able to deliver software in a relevant amount of time that it helps the customer to solve uh, their problem. So why scale? Uh, the most important uh, issue I already said is speed of development. You just need it because you need to be faster. Um, it's also about the complexity. Uh, Many systems uh, require different domains, uh, also something that is hotly debated in Agile, that you have these uh, T-shaped teams and so on, which is all very good if you have that and, and very helpful, but I mean, it still um, is the situation that if you, for example, need to write um, simulation software for, I don't know, energy um, networks or for physical systems, it's not something everybody in the end in the team will be able to do. So you still have specialists. Then when you scale or when you want to be faster and you need more people, you also need to somehow manage the communication head. So overhead, so not everybody can talk to everyone anymore. So you also need to have uh, some kind of structure. Um, that's another reason why you want to uh, scale in a, let's say, controlled way. And you still need to make sure when you have more people that they all aligned and synchronized on uh, what needs to be achieved in what way, uh, when it needs to be finished and so on. So you also need to scale to ensure alignment and synchronization. That probably sounds all quite trivial, but still it's important to um, uh, think about it um, uh, that you can manage it. And we will talk much more about that in the coming slides. Then when you scale, that's one dimension. Another dimension that's equally important in today's world is um, how do you distribute your teams? Again, there are sometimes a kind of a dogmatic view that says uh, co-location is the best. Everyone should be in the same place uh, because then you can have uh, direct face-to-face -face communication and so on and so on. And yes, to a certain degree, this is certainly true, um, but there are also absolutely valid reasons I want to at least touch upon the, why you would like to distribute your teams also geographically. One reason that's probably why most people think it's kind of not a good idea is cost, because uh, sure, if you build up um, uh, teams in, let's say, India or uh, Eastern Europe or so, one option or one reason to do that is obviously because you also want to have um, lower cost. On the other hand side, if you want to also sell your product there, you're probably not competitive if you have only, let's say, um, expensive resources in high cost countries and your competitors all have local resources because it's a local, let's say, um, Indian company or something like that. An even more important reason why you might need to scale is the talent pool. If you really need uh, specialists, and you want to have excellent uh, developers, then it's unlikely that you will find all of these people in one place. Uh, it's just a reason or a matter of how many people um, are coming out of university in that location every year, how many 
can you convince to work for you <clears throat> and so on and so on. So talent pool is one of the main reasons why large uh, companies like Siemens, but also all other large companies tend to hire also in different locations. Another important factor why you would like to distribute is also culture and uh, localization. So if you develop product for the world market, it's often very um, helpful to have people in the places where you want to sell your software to understand what are really the local uh, customer requirements, how do people interact with these systems um, and so on. So, I mean, it's also um, good if you have, let's say, a focus on, let's say, Asian markets to also have development teams over there because then it's much easier than if you try to find out from, let's say, Nuremberg um, what people in, let's say, India want in a software product. Another reason why you typically cannot get around distribution is acquisitions. Um, many companies tend to acquire, especially startups, uh, because they have uh, very good skills, they have great ideas. Now you um, uh, acquire a startup uh, and then suddenly you have um, a second location just because of that. Another reason is diversity with um, having different uh, geographic locations, you also get different views, uh, different um, um, kind of um, ideas into the team, which can also be extremely helpful. And uh, coverage, uh, there I mean basically time zone coverage can also be helpful to have um, uh, multiple time zones covered because they can react faster, obviously. Um, you can do uh, follow the sun principles and also if there are Critical issues, there's always somebody there who can support the customer immediately. Good, so um, let's say I think these are the most important topics here. And just to point it out again, uh, just taking numbers from Siemens, if you have kind of a spread of um, your market where you sell in all regions, um, it's, it's also our policy to try to have developers distributed in more or less the same manner, um, just because it um, A, gives you competitive cost for these different markets and uh, B, because then you have this local touch, so to say, you always have somebody close to the customer to also understand what is uh, really the problem, uh, help with issues and so on. And, and sure, if you do uh, kind of an I don't know, mobile app, maybe you can do it centrally because it's something that uh, everybody has the same expectation. I would doubt that, but let's uh, assume it would be like that. But if you do industrial uh, um, or commercial products where customers require support and that are highly complex, I think you need to have this um, uh, geographical distribution. Good. So what's my summary here? Um, is scaling uh, Agile now a good idea? Um, I mean, uh, it's always, it depends. Um, I would only do it if you uh, did this analysis, which I kind of touched upon in previous slides and come to the understanding uh, you have to do it. It's unavoidable. Uh, and if you do it, and I mean, that's the most important topic, uh, which I will spend the rest of the talk about then you need to do it deliberately. So you need to plan it. It's extremely dangerous to kind of slide into um, uh, scaling uh, uh, software development, especially also in an agile setup and not plan for it properly because then probably you will suffer quite a bit in terms of uh, outcome of uh, the team productivity, quality and so on. And I mean, just to mention it, I'm sure most of you are aware of that there are even companies uh, out there today that uh, do not even have offices. I mean, the largest example that I know about is GitLab. GitLab has no um, uh, company office building. They only do remote development. So it definitely is possible to work like that. But again, GitLab has developed basically a really impressive system and company culture to deal with this um, distributed setup. 
Yeah, now I said, yeah, scaling uh, software um, is difficult. Why is it difficult? Um, probably also know that already, but just to also to mention it, I mean, um, software development is a team activity. You need to talk to other people because you need to understand uh, what's going on in other teams, uh, what are the problems, uh, what's working, what's not working. Team uh, software development is also most of the time in a complex domain. What does it mean when something is complex? Complex means that you cannot plan all the steps to get there. So, I mean, for many years in the past, it was tried to plan um, uh, software projects like, let's say, construction projects. Um, so you plan all the steps, then you do all the steps. Uh, this is not feasible. Um, because nobody knows all the steps. It's almost impossible to understand what is even expected from a complex software system. And it's even more impossible to plan how to construct a complex software system. So Agile is basically um, mandatory, but then you still um, need to have this uh, communication. What's also interesting problem that many people outside of the software domain have a hard time to understand is that it's extremely difficult to assess the quality and completeness of a large software or hybrid system. It's also something that most people that come from traditional project management uh, have a hard time to understand because if there's a construction project, you can walk around, look at, uh, let's say, how many walls are already built, um, what's the status of the electrical installation, and so on and so on. With software, this is um, almost impossible if it was not planned into the execution of the activity from the beginning. What's also interesting um, is that, um, and makes it more complicated, is that you need interdisciplinary teams uh, for most software projects. So you do not only need software developers, you also need, depending on the domain, maybe a graphics designer. Most of the time, you need to user experience expert, um, you need, um, uh, if it's a customer domain that's not uh, only software, let's say coming back to electric, you need a power engineer on the team um, that is able to verify if the um, calculation is correct and so on. And even software is uh, these days so um, uh, specialized that you probably end up needing a database expert, um, a test expert, and so on and so on. And um, what I already mentioned, if you have um, uh, typical industrial or in commercial software, you also need to understand the customer domain, customer domain, which most of the time is um, as complex as the software domain. And the team in the end needs to understand to a certain degree both domains to be really productive. And I mean, all of this is already complicated in one team. Let's say now you have 20 teams, um, then it's even more complicated, especially if they are in 10 different locations and so on. Good. So how, how do you do it? So what I would strongly advise, obviously, is not to reinvent the wheel. In the beginning of um, Agile and also scaling Agile, it was very popular to invent uh, new methods um, to um, say, oh, yes, um, we, we are different than everybody else. So that's why we need to use a different framework. Um, I would strongly advise against that. I mean, um, Siemens uses to a large extent safe, which is also the most used um, agile framework, as you can see from this uh, picture from the survey that is done every year. Um, obviously, there's also a lot of uh, people that criticize uh, safe or other uh, scaling methods. Um, and certainly, framework is not uh, a kind of um, uh, uh, religious uh, text that you have to follow uh, word by word. Um, but still, it's uh, certainly true that there's a lot of experience uh, going into these types of uh, frameworks. And it is uh, probably advised to first start with a framework and then change things after you understood um, what uh, is really different and 
why things need to be adjusted, what's working, what's not working, and so on. Maybe I also want to uh, spend uh, two sentences on um, more philosophical discussion that is around many of these frameworks, but also especially SAFE, where people say, um, yeah, but I mean, when you use these frameworks and these frameworks contain, again, hierarchies and, and so on, um, then you abandon the true uh, path of the agile warrior, so to say. Um, and, and maybe that's true. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure if, if um, you can argue against it. On the other hand side, um, if you have a large organization, you have a certain purpose, uh, you have responsibilities outside of a kind of being agile. It's also difficult for me to come up, um, and we had many discussions and tried many things, to come up with something that's completely um, let's say not having hierarchies and, and not having um, uh, top-down decisions and so on. I mean, I know that there are um, different approaches um, uh, that are also tried out, but I think that's something that really needs to be looked at in the context of the situation of the company. And at least in my experience, I can say that even if uh, SAFE um, or also less, let's say, as another framework that's often used by large corporations is maybe not uh, uh, too agile in the sense that the evangelists are happy with it as still much better than trying to do traditional project management. Good. So um, now if you use a framework, um, you want to introduce um, uh, uh, a scaled agile approach, um, what do you really need in terms of ingredients? And I mean, you need to address many uh, different levels um, of the organization. You have organizational topics, you need to address operational topics and technical topics that need to be addressed. And um, it's, it's sometimes surprising for, again, people that come not from this domain, when you talk about these things, because people potentially think software development is mostly um, a coding, a kind of a very anti-social activity, uh, while uh, it's actually the total opposite and uh, running successful software development is mostly about uh, having happy um, teams uh, that uh, uh, work well together and um, uh, you have all these other pieces in place. In this talk, also to point it out, I will talk mostly about organizational topics, a little bit about operational topics, and um, we'll only have uh, uh, two minutes on technical, because technical is then a totally different talk, would be more discussion about architecture and software design and so on, and uh, that would definitely not fit into the allotted time frame here. So what is, um, from an organizational point of view, the most important topic? From my point of view, the most important topic is, again, not software development, it's uh, culture. And uh, there I would <clears throat> probably start with trust. It's extremely interesting, and I've been soft doing software development um, in, in, let's say, larger organizations now for uh, about 25 years or so that one of the main reasons why um, teams do not work well together and uh, let's say um, uh, large projects do not work is because people do not trust each other. So it's extremely important to uh, create this trust. Another topic that um, sounds trivial, but sometimes not so easy is to create this common purpose for the whole organization. Um, and then the Another topic that's super important is this psychological safety, because the larger an uh, organization becomes, I mean, it's like, a, let's say also if you have um, a large gathering uh, of, of people, no matter what context, the larger the crowd gets, so to say, the less likely it is that somebody tries something new or says something uh, he or she is not 100% certain about if there is immediate uh, kind of um, uh, uh, pushback 
and, and people um, are kind of feeling uncomfortable with that. Then obviously the other thing you need is the process. The process I'm going to talk about here, which is mostly following the safe framework is based on the traditional Scrum or Kanban process. Um, I assume you are familiar with that, so we'll not really talk about that in the uh, uh, coming uh, presentation. You require layers of hierarchy, again, where you can have uh, uh, different opinions if that is good or bad, and you need additional roles and rituals to keep everything flowing. And as I said, uh, tailoring is definitely a requirement. It makes no sense to pick a framework and stick to it word by word. Good. So, trust. How do you create trust? Um, yes, and even in uh, COVID-19 times, um, it's still true that to create trust initially, you need to have some in-person meetings. Um, it's extremely difficult. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's really difficult to build up trust um, only with um, video conferences and so on. And if you really have to do it, uh, really uh, turn on your camera, obviously, because um, every uh, inch of getting closer to each other is important to establish uh, this trust relationship. What's also extremely helpful is to have social events. Um, and for example, I made the example of GitLab. GitLab has regular social events where all people in the region meet or where all people all over the world meet because that's the glue that keeps in the end the organization um, uh, uh, together uh, is this uh, to know each other and to know that people are dependent on you and that you have to depend on other people. So uh, getting to know each other outside of the work context is extremely important. What's also possibilities, obviously, we have people uh, travel between locations and stay there for an extended period of time. What's really important from a leadership perspective is uh, to have open communication. What does that mean? It means all locations, all teams, um, all people in each team have always the same access to all information at all times. Uh, there is no uh, kind of hiding of information. Um, the different teams, locations, people have equal opportunities and all people are treated uh, the same and fair. Um, if, if this is not true, it's extremely difficult again to establish trust. What's also important is this uh, common purpose. So where do we want to go? What do we want to achieve? Um, I'm not sure if this is easy to understand, but it's really sometimes, let's say you have 200 people in three uh, different locations. And now you need to achieve something, let's say in, in three or four months. Then it's extremely important to focus all of these people on this uh, purpose to, to make clear what needs to be achieved, why this is important. And uh, then kind of afterwards let it people decide how to achieve it, right? I mean, this is still important that people can decide how to do something, uh, how to get there. But the, the, the direction uh, is something that needs to be provided in a very clear and uh, also um, well uh, understandable uh, manner. It's also helpful, obviously, for people to talk to customers, um, um, to understand why customers um, need to solve the problem, what the problem really looks like, a kind of to, to be able to touch the problem, so to say. It's also important that people can see what's happening in the market overall. And um, it's also an interesting method that we use uh, from time to time is uh, job shadowing so that people go, for example, with a um, solution engineer to the customer side and uh, configure the system and see what's working, what's not working, or help the solution design so that you get a different perspective um, and not get stuck in your specific uh, domain or specialty, basically. Good. So, um, what's important about um, 
the um, psychological safety. There was a study done by Google. Uh, this rework is basically a Google website. You can find it. They uh, have uh, documented basically their uh, HR system and made it, made it public domain. It's quite interesting. If you're interested in something like that. And this study was uh, done to find out what makes team teams um, um, uh, productive, what makes teams uh, great, basically. And they found out that these five topics here on the left are the most important topics uh, that makes a team um, uh, productive. And the number one uh, topic is this uh, psychological safety. Um, the other topics are also very important. And I mean, I already talked about dependability. Basically, this is this trust uh, uh, topic to an extent. And meaning is the purpose, right? Um, and uh, so it's along the same lines. Psychological safety is really important because if you basically try to get the best people on the team into your organization. And if there's uh, no psychological safety, you run the risk that many of these uh, fantastic people, you spend a lot of time um, hiring and, and uh, training will never really contribute anything because they think hmm, maybe I say something stupid. The last time I said something that was not uh, correct, uh, basically everybody um, uh, was uh, uh, kind of uh, telling me uh, that I was wrong and so on. And uh, from that point of view, this is really extremely important that this is something that's managed very uh, um, consciously by everybody that um, uh, saying, uh, let's say, things that are not uh, kind of 100% proven or trying out new things must lead to uh, uh, learning, but never to punishment. This is something that I think um, is also, especially in <laughs> Germany, we still have sometimes problem uh, with. And it's something I can only point out that it's of the most important topics if you want to uh, get the most out of uh, teams. Good. Any questions so far? Uh, can you still hear me? I just want to check because sometimes it's really strange to talk into this microphone. Mm, there seem to be no questions so far. OK, very good. Then. Now let's talk about the process a little bit. Again, I will use SAFE as the example uh, simply because uh, I use it uh, basically every day and I'm very familiar with it. But I mean, I also know the other scaling frameworks and many of them are similar. Um, so it's uh, just for me the easiest to use this example. And uh, let me a little bit point out here. Uh, I know this picture, usually people say it's so complicated. Uh, I do not understand it. What is it really about? It's really layered, as you can see in the picture, and on the top layer here. So basically, uh, this piece here. This is um, all about um, where do I want to go in the, let's say, strategically in the next two or three years? Um, um, do I want to go to the, I don't know, Asian markets? Do I want to target um, people that, uh, I don't know, have sports cars? I don't know. It can be anything. But this is basically discussed in, on this level. This is also where you assign um, a budget, um, which means in the end resources to the activities. So that is a discussion that um, is more on the uh, business side, so to say. Um, uh, obviously, also has technical implications. If you want to, let's say, sell something um, in, in Asia, maybe you need to have a data center there. Maybe you need to build up um, uh, experts. You need to do market studies. But it's still not a kind of um, implementation work that's happening here. The next level here in the middle is um, solution design. This is um, if you have a complex system that needs integration, especially also maybe with external suppliers or with uh, hardware, 
then you still need to obviously at some point do integration. Uh, that is this layer in the middle. Let's say you are now non, you don't need these two things. You just want to um, uh, develop a larger software where the strategy is clear. You don't have to do hardware integration. Then you basically uh, need the, the um, uh, level below with this agile release train and the scrum teams. And that's also where we spend most of the time afterwards, because again, um, <clears throat> what you can do with this lower level is basically scale up to a size of, let's say, maybe 120 to 150 people, which is uh, already quite considerably and uh, will probably be sufficient for most of the activities. Okay, very good. So, um, how do you now really scale? Um, uh, and here comes the only complicated uh, animated slide in the presentation, I promise. Um, so if you have a traditional Scrum team, just to say it again, you have a team, you have a <coughs> product owner who is responsible for the customer communication of the Scrum master who is responsible for kind of coaching the team to constantly improve, um, to organize uh, ceremonies and so on. And uh, basically the communication with the customer would run through the product owner, customers' problem expenses to the product owner. You have a team backlog, you start working. It's that easy. Unfortunately now, let's say you have um, 120 people working on something and you have um, also with that uh, logic much more software um, things become much more complicated and that's what i try to explain with the next slide uh, how that really looks like so um, now you have many teams uh, let's say just uh, for the purpose of the question let's say you have 10 teams which also means you have probably 10 product owners, maybe some teams share one product owner, but uh, anyhow, so yeah, then you have um, an additional role, which is the product manager. The product manager is then the contact to talk to uh, uh, one or most of the many customers. The product owner will then uh, typically have uh, two to four product owners um, that uh, translate the program backlog that's then created by the product management team into the team backlog. So you already have one additional layer of redirection from customer to the product manager, then you already have a backlog on a higher level um, to contain these um, features it's called in SAFE into the stories uh, that are then dealt with by the team. So that's the scaling. Uh, to the customer side. You also need to scale on the internal side. Obviously, the Scrum Masters somehow need to talk to each other very regularly and align about uh, blockers, um, uh, progress issues, and so on. Um, this role in SAFE is called uh, Release Train Engineer. I, it's a little bit silly name, but it doesn't really matter. There are many other names in other frameworks. But basically, this is uh, the uh, Scrum of Scrum's uh, uh, master, so to say, that manages the overall organization improvement measures, uh, organizational capabilities of the whole um, uh, release train. If you have a large system, you also need to plan more strategically how do you develop your software from an architectural point of view, right? I mean, in Agile, you have this concept of emergent architecture, which in my opinion works really well. But if you have uh, 10 or 20 teams working in a software and you need to deliver something, let's say, uh, with a horizon of uh, one or one year or, or 15 months or so, you need to do a little bit of um, architectural planning, which is called in say, this architectural runway. And you need a system architect or group of system architects that plan um, the, the development of this runway. 
the system architect or architects need to talk to um, the teams again. Um, there are different ways to organize it. The way we typically organize it is that we have a community of practice. So a group of uh, architects, one from each team, that then talking to the system architect regularly to align on how to uh, make sure we follow the architecture runway. If you have a large organization, you also need some infrastructure. It's called it. You need a CI CD pipeline. You need end to end testing. So not only on, let's say, module or, or microservice level, but also for the system. So you need a, a team that's called system team in sales that coordinates these activities, provides infrastructure and, and uh, basically helps teams to coordinate uh, um, activities that require multiple teams to interact on a, uh, let's say, planning level when it comes to infrastructure, resources, also test systems. Many systems require quite um, elaborate hardware setups to be tested. This is in the domain of the system team. Good, and then you obviously also need um, um, this management team that I was already talking about that provides this um, strategy. You need to support people, uh, coach them. Um, you need to make sure people understand um, what's the strategy, what do you want to achieve. It's still extremely important uh, that here we stick again to um, the um, agile principle of servant leadership. So there is some top-down communication that's clear, um, uh, but most of the time it should be a support function. So the organization that's working on the solution on the customer problem basically knows that if they have a problem, the leadership team is there to support them with this problem and uh, the, provides, uh, let's say, removes blocking points, provides resources and so on. So I, I tried here to explain a little bit uh, how um, this scaling basically then changes the, um, the, let's say, very simple structure that you know from Scrum. And um, when you see this picture, you probably also understand why uh, many people feel somehow uncomfortable with uh, the scaling frameworks and say that cannot be agile anymore. And uh, as I said, I can get it to a certain degree. Um, uh, but somehow it's like a democracy. Maybe it's not a very good system, but it's still the best we have found so far. I would say we this is similar here. Um, if uh, somebody would come up with a much better system, I uh, would be happy to adopt it, but uh, so far we have not found it. Good. Um, as I already said, um, you can now tailor on all levels. Um, if you don't need a solution here, you just remove it. If you don't need um, strategic planning, um, you can remove it and so on and so on. So this is definitely all exactly what is intended by the framework or by all frameworks. Frameworks are always meant to be tailored. But again, I would just caution um, that you should only tailor what you understand and not um, embark and uh, before you understood why something is there, remove it. That can lead to uh, interesting results. What's also important, and maybe again, it's obvious, uh, maybe not, but I want to talk about it quickly, is that this uh, different layers also have um, different planning horizons. And that is also something that's super important for an organization and also for customers, uh, that especially in an industrial environment, you cannot go to a customer and say, um, we can only tell you what will happen in the next four weeks because um, agile scrum teams only plan for two weeks and maybe we can plan for uh, uh, three iterations and, and everything else we don't know. So uh, this hierarchy um, also allows you to have an outlook for, let's say, um, uh, one to maybe two years. You can have a quite detailed view 
for three to four months, uh, two to three to, to three to four months, and you have then still the team view. This is super helpful um, because um, uh, people cannot, uh, my experience, most people cannot really work in an environment that has only very short term view. You, you need to have some longer term view. You just need to be careful not to confuse uh, uh, kind of this um, outlook with uh, uh, commitment. Because I mean, one of the big benefits of being agile is that you can always react to changes. And if you commit to something on, let's say, in 18 months roadmap, then suddenly you are not longer uh, flexible to um, react to other changes. I mean, you can do some commitments, but you need to manage it very carefully. Good. So. If you now plan to um, Mr. Stockman, if you may, yes. I would like sure. to ask um, a short question about that. Absolutely. So um, you mentioned that one should not uh, confuse commitment with outlook, but I imagine that especially in a company of the size of Siemens and also in a company that's as established in the market as Siemens, um, even an outlook might be implicitly counted as a commitment. So it might be really difficult to, to change it. What is your experience and observation with that? Is there actually that change that the outlook allows going on or is it in fact a commitment? Yeah, that's an excellent question because that's something I've been dealing with now for let's say, I would say the last 10 years or so since we started to also talk about Agile, I mean, we started to implement Agile maybe um, already um, almost 20 years ago, but uh, in the beginning was some kind of something people did um, and did not talk about because everybody thought it's kind of crazy. Then uh, let's say the last 10 years, maybe we started to also talk about uh, after people discovered it's maybe not such a crazy idea. And since then, I would say the customer expectation and also the acceptance of these messes has changed dramatically. It's different by industry. I mean, there are some industries that are extremely conservative and for good reasons. And I mean, the one I'm currently working in is one of these industries. Uh, if you are responsible for, um, let's say, um, a power distribution network that has a lifetime of 30 years or something like that, you don't want to, get told by your supplier that he suddenly changed his um, uh, ideas in the last three weeks. But in general, I would say that uh, customers are more and more understanding that it is not useful to um, have um, uh, very long-term software commitments because uh, the world is simply too quickly changing. And we even see now <clears throat> in the last, let's say two or three years that customers explicitly require us um, to use agile uh, processes um, because they say uh, they have had so bad experiences with uh, traditional processes and with these commitments that they insist we have an agile planning process where they are allowed to basically change uh, their um, opinion um, without kind of having to renegotiate the whole contract or something like that. So. From that point of view, I think there's a big change going on. People understand the uh, power of uh, having this um, uh, ability to adjust scope, but it still, let's say, depends very much on the specific customer and on the industry. There are still uh, customers in industries that basically want to see a three-year roadmap that is supposed to never change. That's definitely true. Cool, thank you. Good. Yeah. So if you now implement it, um, and, and this uh, then um, goes uh, really then very operational, but I think I also worthwhile to talk about a little bit, then you need to really plan a lot. I mean, um, you have to imagine now you have 120 people. Ideally, they know what Scrum is, um, uh, but now you have to find people that uh, learn how to do 
how to be a release train engineer, you have to um, uh, find people that want to be in the systems team, you have to train all people on how does the framework really work, um, you, you have to uh, make sure your organization understands the change. So this is a quite involved process and typically um, I would say if you are um, put a lot of effort into it and, and you have done it before, maybe moving to, to a, a safe uh, environment with, with the launch of your first Agile release train here, that's something that takes somehow between six months and if you're really super fast, maybe three months, but that is really then uh, quite uh, ambitious basically. Uh, but again, there are um, established methods uh, how to do it. Um, but it's again something that should be uh, planned properly because uh, you always have to imagine uh, the, the flip side, uh, you don't do it properly, you end up with uh, very expensive people um, that are totally confused and do not produce anything useful and certainly nobody wants that. If you now do um, these activities, um, and again, I just want to show an example. One of the main activities is the PI planning. The PI planning is the activity where ideally all the uh, stakeholders meet um, every quarter or so. Um, um, so again, if it's a, a, a larger organization, let's say it's one release train with 120 people, including the stakeholders, then all 120 people would meet and would um, uh, determine um, what and how to proceed for the next uh, two and a half to three months. And uh, obviously most of the work needs to be done before the meeting, all the uh, backlog items need to be uh, um, uh, tailored, need to be, be um, uh, enhanced, need to be discussed with the teams, that the teams understand what is the scope of the work that needs to be done and um, just that you can imagine a little bit this is really then going into the um, uh, work of the release engineer this is a really a very how should I say a pure um, uh, organizational task you need to write a, a proper agenda you need to create the information about uh, who needs to be where when uh, how does everything work, um, what's the infrastructure to be used, what uh, is happening if something is not working in the meeting, let's say suddenly the Zoom meeting would not work, what do we do with them, and so on and so on. I can show you a little bit how that looks like. I hope I find it quickly. Yes, here, I mean, this is uh, uh, one of the wikis to be used, and here you have then described uh, the infrastructure on top here, and then you have a very detailed schedule for the different days. So you have the opening, you have uh, the reflection and improvement workshop, you have the system demo where all the teams demonstrate what was done in the last two and a half and three months. You will look at the KPIs that were measured, then you have the second day where you have uh, again, um, different activities and so on and so on. You can see these activities is like planning a conference uh, or something like that. So it is something that uh, requires um, a group of people to work very uh, uh, diligently on this to make it productive. And again, remember, if it's not productive, you wasted the time of 120 people in the end. What is also extremely helpful, and we do it basically all the time now, is that it's clear who is responsible for the infrastructure um, in each location. So if there is a problem with something, it's uh, clear who is responsible to fix it. We had many meetings where suddenly, in the beginning, years ago, where suddenly a microphone did not work or the network connection was not good enough. I mean, all of these things have uh, luckily improved quite a bit in the last couple of years, but um, this is still something to consider. And what do you get out of uh, such a, a, a meeting that takes typically two to three days? 
what you get out is basically uh, on the one hand side that uh, you get from each team and then obviously also for the whole organization what are really the objectives so who is committed to deliver what and also what's the value of each of these activities so there's a business value assigned to each activity which helps you to rank the uh, tasks what you also get out uh, of the meeting and that's why you need to meet uh, basically in person and uh, have all the teams in one meeting um, uh, be it now in one location or uh, virtually you get out all the dependencies because uh, what you get obviously if you have multiple teams and uh, also complex software is dependency between the teams you also can plan for um, uh, specific milestones uh, for example here in this example it's a, a an event happening there because let's assume you also plan a release um, that needs to be shipped to a customer or so that needs to be obviously planned in advance so this meeting helps you to plan all of these activities check the dependencies and make sure you can address all of this and what you also get um, is a clear um, uh, understanding and distribution of the risks so risk management obviously is also extremely important activity in all um, uh, projects and also in software development and um, so in the end of the meeting you also know which risk could be resolved uh, who is responsible for the risk that could not be resolved and also who accepted which risk are simply accepted so you cannot do anything about it and what are the mitigation measures for the risk that can be mitigated? And obviously, each team then takes the um, the objectives. And um, one second here. takes the objectives and uh, uses them to um, uh, uh, transfer the, the stories um, and, and refine the stories that they then actually will work on to deliver the objectives after the meeting. Okay, so what else do you need? I mean, and uh, I cannot really talk about all of it. It would take way too long. So I just want to touch on one of the few topics, for example, you need uh, this uh, Scrum of Scrums meeting um, where all the Scrum Master meet to discuss um, blocking points, accomplishments, and um, uh, basically also how to resolve these blocking points. And uh, typically this is then hosted by the release train engineer. Good. What is also important and what I definitely recommend in larger organizations um, um, always is that you enable cross-team communication um, on, on uh, let's say, various topics. We call it and Seth calls it community of practice. Um, other frameworks call it guild. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's basically a community uh, which means uh, that there are people that care about a specific topic, so the domain, uh, and also the people that really care about it, so it's kind of typically self-organized, and uh, people then talk about uh, how to do it um, and uh, how can it be done better, basically. It's super important because that enables uh, cross-organizational knowledge sharing. I mean, you can even have these communities um, uh, outside of the company, right? For example, I go to a agile community here in the Zurich area where I live quite regularly and there are different companies there because again agile is not a company secret you can certainly talk about it it promotes best practices it also creates this trust again people know each other and understand um, uh, who can help them 
and you can have different types of communities and, and we also actually have these different kinds all at the same time we have some that are more formal um, for example for architecture this is um, teams can still decide who they send to the uh, uh, community of practice for architecture or for user experience but they need to send somebody and in the end what is decided by the community of practice uh, is kind of a guideline so it's not kind of um, uh, like a law but it's a strong recommendation let's put it like this or they can be completely self-organized um, or they can even be about non-work related topics i mean sometimes we have then communities about i don't know uh, photography or games or whatever um, again it's uh, also about this trust sharing good so that would conclude the part where I talk about the organizational topics and I would move on to operational topics. <clears throat> and I think most of these topics probably are not so surprising anymore, but still I wanted to touch upon them. So obviously for the operational uh, side, you need um, different tools. Um, and again, there are so many good tools these days uh, that it's um, uh, not that difficult anymore. You need a communication tool like Zoom or Slack or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, you need ALM tools or so application lifecycle management tools. Uh, we'll talk about why that's important. You need to see ICD pipeline and you need a good network. You also need to plan around time zones if you're distributed and you need to consider language and culture. And when I say culture here, I don't mean company or agile culture. I mean really the um, regional uh, country culture that uh, needs to be considered. Why is uh, communication so difficult again? And I mean, there are hundreds of studies about this and I'm sure you heard about this before. Uh, it's just that uh, communication has uh, different um, bandwidth, so to say, and effectiveness. And um, especially if you cannot meet every day in the office, you really need to make sure you get the best uh, possible effectiveness that is available um, um, remotely. Um, if not, you're just wasting everybody's time and frustrate people to a, a great extent. So that's what we are using um, for our teams. We use video conferencing. We have a chat that support groups and channels. Again, pretty standard these days, I would say. What's also extremely helpful is an electronic whiteboard for visual collaboration. So um, here that means you have a whiteboard that actually all people can collaborate on at the same time. That is extremely important. And you have some kind of traditional office suite that uh, allows concurrent editing. For me, uh, after my experience, this is the uh, minimum set um, that I would go with in terms of collaboration tools. Um, and you always have to remember that remote collaboration requires over communication. I mean, it's one of these um, um, uh, theories, uh, and um, it's hard for me to tell if it's true or not, that this is easier for um, millennials or uh, people that are even younger than that because they are kind of uh, grew up with these communication tools, but still you have to remember that there are other locations, uh, other people that you don't see at the moment. And um, in the end, you even need to plan casual interactions because it's not like you meet in the coffee corner and then decide to go for pizza in the evening. You have to basically um, uh, pick up uh, uh, your phone or go to the chat and uh, then you have to find out if you can even meet and so on and so on. So I just want to find it, it requires more effort and you need to consider this effort um, on a daily basis. Exactly. So what I think um, is one of the better things that uh, uh, was invented in the last couple of years is 
electronic whiteboard. So this is super helpful. For example, here you see we did a dot voting um, uh, for confidence vote, which is a topic in uh, the PI planning. And again, I mean, uh, sure, you can also, I don't know, send an email <laughs> with your vote to the Scrum Master, but I mean, it creates a totally different dynamic if you have a uh, whiteboard and people can see the dots moving around and uh, can see the different people interacting. So this is really something that is important. What's also extremely important uh, is the um, uh, ALM tool. Again, there are many uh, great tools, uh, probably Jira from Atlassian is the most uh, well known these days, but the Steam Foundation server and so on and so on, it doesn't really matter. Why is this so important? The most important topic from my point of view is that if you, if people in the team, so all team members um, in all locations cannot see what's currently going on, this creates uh, mistrust. So the opposite of what we want, we want to create trust. So the tool basically is mostly a transparency a hygiene factor to make sure everybody knows what's going on everywhere and also what's the status of everything everywhere at all times. And again, there are people, and I talked to quite some of them that say, yeah, but if you really want to be agile, you have to have a physical report and paper and so on. And yes, this is uh, totally fantastic. I, I would not even use it, by the way, if I would have only one team in one location, but uh, no matter, um, uh, but for remote collaboration and for team sizes, uh, we are talking about here, this is totally impractical. I cannot recommend that. And then there are also industries, uh, again, something that might not be the biggest fun, but many industries require full traceability from requirement to test case and back. So you need to be able to prove, uh, did you implement this requirement? Did you test the requirement? And can you prove that the test uh, fulfills the requirement? Um, if you need to do this, I mean, then you anyway, if you're not uh, totally crazy, use the tool. And um, my experience is if you use the same tool, it's pretty uh, seamless these days. Tools are really fantastic uh, today. And you have a very little additional effort for that. And another big benefit of such a tool is that the database that's created um, or the data set that is created over time is uh, very helpful to analyze what's working, what's not working, and then we need to make improvements. I mean, here are just some examples. Um, what, what do we measure, for example, maybe just on the right side here. Here we have different features, and the green part of the feature is always what is already implemented, tested, and accepted. Uh, and the gray part is, for example, what is still open. Blue part is currently under implementation. And then you see, um, and the length of the bus, the amount of stories. And when you see this picture, it gives you a quite easy visual overview of where you are currently, right? And I mean, visual management is anyway a cornerstone of lean and agile management. So it's really important that teams have access to something dashboard like, easy to understand, where they can see immediately what's going on and don't have to read through pages of reports or something like that. CICD, again, uh, I think it's kind of um, a no brainer these days, but it becomes even more important if you have a large uh, organization or distributed organization, because uh, people don't, people can only manage or react to topics they um, know and understand. And if your system takes, I don't know, three days uh, to be deployed, um, then most developers um, will have uh, forgotten more or less uh, um, when, when the system does fail or there's a defect somewhere, did they really work on this topic? Did they not work on the topic? So to have this uh, as fast as uh, uh, technically possible is uh, super important for developers to have high productivity. And uh, testing is also extremely important because if you have good uh, automated testing, that also reduces the risk that you deploy something into 
um, uh, test system that breaks the whole system or that your build pipeline breaks and so on and so on. So this is, again, cannot be underestimated and it's important to start with this early on because if you have already large system, it's very likely that you will run into many uh, blocking points if you want to implement it afterwards. What's also important, obviously, is to um, be very, um, to, to acknowledge uh, time zones and acknowledge uh, different languages and culture. Um, again, probably these days is not that exotic anymore than it was uh, 20 years or 30 years ago, but still you need to uh, agree on uh, what are the overlap hours so that people can talk to each other. My experience is typically teams at some point then also adjust uh, to these different rhythms. It can also be again then used with uh, the proper tooling that people can um, dial in in the first meeting from home. I mean, it also needs to be practical from a uh, work uh, life balance point of view, right? People also have another life outside of the office and you need to make sure that's also working well. But you can also use it for advantage with hand over and uh, follow the sun principle. And with culture, I mean, I worked really with uh, quite, uh, um, I worked a lot with China, with India, with the US, um, with um, Eastern European countries. And the most important topic here is um, that you have to keep an open mind. Um, and um, it's also important to talk about uh, um, stuff that's outside of the work to get a feeling for the people. And uh, maybe my most important advice here, if you somehow have the feeling um, in the meeting, um, uh, somehow this uh, does not feel right, uh, uh, there must be something wrong, then it's absolutely important to ask. Uh, assuming things is dangerous at the best of times in an uh, intercultural environment to assume something is, um, uh, most of the time uh, uh, fatal because people in different uh, cultural contexts uh, will have totally different assumptions and you will end up in a total misunderstanding. Good. Then technical and there will be extremely brief because again that goes more into the domain of architecture and software uh, design. Clearly, if your system is uh, not set up to be developed uh, with a larger team or with a distributed team, you will struggle very much. So the architecture needs to be well structured, it needs to be documented. I mean, ideally, if you start today, you have something like a microservices architecture or something similar. I mean, microservice is not always the right uh, architecture approach, but um, it is well separated in concerns and so on. You have a well established test uh, culture in the teams, you have test automation. And as much as possible, and it's not always possible, um, you should have uh, feature teams, which means teams can implement features independent from other teams, so you reduce communication overhead. What's also important, especially again for industrial software, is that your whole runtime environment, so where you run the software and where you also test the software, that should be virtualized as much as possible. Maybe you now think about yeah, this, not, uh, is that not always the case? But um, imagine it's something, um, and I mean, my grid control is always a good example. You have something that only makes sense if it's connected to thousands of um, remote uh, terminal units or connected to measurements devices or connected to, we also have uh, mobility by in Siemens connected to trains uh, and so on. So this is not um, a given in such an environment and then still you need to have a setup where people can have access from everywhere, where devices that cannot be available to everybody are simulated and where people can test and, and experiment without having to wait. It is still common and it was much more common years ago that um, you end up in situations where people then have to kind of reserve a system to perform a specific test. 
Sometimes that's certainly unavoidable, but I mean, if you really want to be as fast as possible, um, then you need to have a fully virtualized system that can be um, set up automatically in minutes uh, where devices and data sources are simulated or people will lose a lot of time. So, I mean, again, this is your target, but that doesn't mean it's easy to achieve, obviously. What's also important, and I mean, uh, now you can ask, is this really related to scaling agile? Uh, maybe not, but it's still something that's important to consider when you do um, your scaling, um, that you monitor also, do you invest enough in refactoring? It's very easy when you scale up um, uh, and, and to when people do agile development, that people are super motivated in the sense we want to deliver a lot of um, features, uh, customer value, um, and, and people focus so much on achieving targets that they somehow forget that the system really requires this invest of about 40%. If you forget this, and if you don't assign a clear responsibility to this in an, a growing um, uh, organization, it's uh, quite likely that you end up with uh, piece of software that's extremely hard to maintain and then your productivity really goes down dramatically. So it's important to make sure uh, while everybody is focusing on customer value and being fast and being flexible uh, that you still uh, kind of have good governance on do you invest enough of your effort into uh, this continuous refactoring. And I already said it, uh, try to remove all bottlenecks um, in the process, no matter, uh, let's say, where the bottleneck is. By, uh, let's say, uh, technology most of the time, uh, this is also something that people sometimes um, forget and then um, you basically um, uh, take out the speed because, yes, first you develop features super fast, but then it takes you three weeks to test the feature because you only have one test environment or something like that. Okay, uh, which brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope it was interesting um, and um, I also hope you have a couple of questions. I think we have a couple of minutes left as far as I know. So thanks for listening and um, uh, go ahead. Thank you for the great talk, Mr. Stockmann. And we already have the first question by Alex Barnhill. Alex, your mic is on now. Hi, um, thanks very much um, for, the, for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, you mentioned at the beginning and also several times um, afterwards that, that trust um, is, is core to um, not only agile as as kind of a, a methodology um, in the small scale, but also um, especially when scaling. Um, and I was wondering if you had um, experience or kind of a bit of insight. Um, my experience um, with large um, international companies like Siemens is that uh, job security is very important. Um, and with that comes lack of trust um, of one's colleagues because the, the idea is that you've earned your knowledge and um, you don't necessarily want to um, impart that knowledge um, upon your, your colleagues if you don't absolutely have to, um, which seems to me that this would make a difficult um, uh, working environment for a for an agile team and I wondered if you had any experience with that um, and if you could um, perhaps say anything to that point. Yeah sure I mean absolutely you're totally right this is a, a typical uh, pattern that people uh, kind of acquired uh, know-how then they come to the conclusion that uh, now this is their know-how and they don't want to share it um, because it gives them this uh, perceived job security. And I don't think that there's an easy uh, solution, unfortunately. Um, it's something where you need to continuously work on um, um, in the organization, um, 
with, with different activities to um, uh, kind of um, reduce the situation. I mean, if you again, if you have, um, if you start with a, a, a blank piece of paper, there are many things you can do already in the setup to to um, uh, maybe reduce the risk of such a situation, like this T-shaped. T-sized uh, T-shaped teams, and and you can have this knowledge sharing and so on. If you basically transform an existing organization and structures like that are already established, then it's very much uh, in the end uh, a coaching activity on on team and employee level where you have to convince people that it's actually better for everybody if the knowledge is shared. Um, my experience is it's uh, most of the time it's absolutely possible to achieve this, but it most of the time also takes quite some effort to achieve it. And again, the most important, um, uh, let's say, um, ingredient to, to be successful here is to show the employee that has the knowledge that he has nothing to fear from sharing his knowledge, right? I mean, if you basically are in a situation where um, um, everybody is kind of uh, thinking, um, I'm, am I still here tomorrow? <laughs> and then you try to tell somebody, please tell me everything you know, uh, because it's better for you. Then it probably is extremely hard to believe for that individual that it's really better for the individual. So again, it's about this safety uh, situation that you have to create. Um. One quick follow-up: Do you think it's it's a it's a it's a generational thing that we're going to see start dying out, um, or perhaps an in, um, an industry thing where it's just you know it, it kind of comes with the territory with 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 um, with larger companies um, and with people who are kind of I guess set in their ways or um, I don't know I really don't I I, I can't understand that mindset where this where this idea comes from that you know it's better for me if i if i don't say anything um that just has never been my experience my experience has always been that it's better to cooperate with people and you're you're always better when you work together um so i really i, I have no idea where that comes from Yes, I mean, I would fully agree with you. It's also my experience that this is much more uh, successful to do that. Um, and I, I can really not say if it's a generational thing. I mean, I have to say that the, let's say, younger people that um, I worked with in the last couple of years um, uh, definitely had, and can, when you talk about people, it's always kind of, uh, Difficult because everyone is obviously totally different. But in in in, in the broad sense, I would also say that uh, I have not seen this behavior. People are much more curious and also uh, much more interested in moving around. And again, if you want to move around, then it's actually counterproductive to hoard a lot of know-how um, because then nobody wants to let you go or try something new. Right? In that point of view, it's. Um, Totally wrong behavior, but it's I think too early to tell if we uh, if if this is kind of eliminated uh, by uh, just the uh, change of generations or if it's something that comes uh, after you worked uh, for 15 years in a domain. And um, I mean I, I alluded to it a little bit in the the the, the presentation. It's also really to say that some topics, some domains, some know-how is really um, uh, very special and it's also sometimes really difficult to keep this know-how in, in a useful, uh, let's say, capacity in an organization. Let's say you have a super complex uh, software and you need uh, maybe 100 developers, but you only need three experts for some numerical simulation topic that's part of your software. Know-how management is also a difficult topic when it comes to this type of software. and, and Maybe then this also um, drives this behavior. I don't know. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much for your insights. Any additional questions? Remember, you can just use the raise hand symbol and we'll give you the right to speak.
Okay, well, I have one question. I know that uh, okay, some well, Siemens divisions, oh, I know wait, that, I have uh, to mute Alex first Siemens because I hear an echo. Wait, I have to mute Alex first. Test, test, ah, excellent. So I know that uh, some Siemens divisions and business units are um, experimenting with inner source um, as a way to collaborate. So open source communities, but within the context, within the confines of an organization. Is that something that you tried out in your business unit? Do you have experiences made with that to scale collaboration? Yes, we have. Uh, I have experiences with that. Um, we um, basically collaborate on an um, UI um, framework extension. Um, it's not the whole framework we also use in industry available uh, open source um, framework, but we have made quite some additions to it that are Siemens specific and uh, we collaborate on that. It's an extremely interesting approach. I think also something that is uh, very, um, uh, can, can be very productive and rewarding for people. Um, I also have to say on the other hand side, um, the inner source community approach uh, basically I would say has the same um, difficulties um, or, or let's say um, requirements than an open source approach that is successful. Um, um, what does that mean? Um, it, it means that it requires uh, very, very engaged people that um, very actively manage uh, these communities. Uh, you need uh, strong maintainers and so on. So yes, it, it can be successful but it also requires a quite um, a high level of engagement. So it's, it's not easy. It's, and it, especially it's not something where the management can come and say, uh, please do inner source. I mean, uh, because the, the uh, level of engagement that is required from um, employees is so high, can only work on an, um, let's say, level where people are um, self-organized, self-motivated and I think this is uh, the right thing to do. So if I summarize, you would say that it doesn't replace or it will not replace scaled agile framework uh, and the other approaches, but rather is uh, an addendum to it. Exactly. I mean, we do, exactly. So we, we use inner source for uh, topics where we see a lot of, um, where topic is very broad. So many people can use it but it's not um, uh, differentiating in the sense of it's a feature where people would pay extra for. That's where we typically use inner source and for the stuff where we say we solve a customer problem. So what people really want to buy from Siemens there, we use, uh, let's say, uh, normal software development practices, like for example, say for Scrum teams or whatever is the right approach for the size of the activity. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, so I saw that uh, I accidentally muted uh, Professor Riele. So um, I assume, Dirk, that uh, you wanted to say something as well. So I'll uh, give you back the speaking rights. So I'll give you back the speaking rights. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, no problem, Max. Uh, somehow, uh, since I'm your co-host, uh, I couldn't raise my hand, uh, but thanks for managing it anyway. Well, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, talk. Now I actually have plenty of questions uh, getting backwards at it, perhaps because Max just raised um, inner source. And so I'm curious about the relationship because our observation is indeed also that agile methods and inner source work together well. And it's almost like they have different purposes. So classic agile means you're business value driven. So for example, you would implement a feature across all technology layers, but you clearly do it because you see how the feature adds business value. And inner source, is always about something that's usable or reusable across multiple products usually. So um, it comes into play as soon as people have to collaborate on some infrastructure. 
And that's actually both a contradiction, I think, and a nice integration point. Agile methods or Scrum potentially creates a mess if you implement a feature without looking left and right. You just implement the feature and then um, you possibly violate some architecture constraints because you're focused on your feature only. But if you have feature teams, so meaning different people working together, but on different technology layers, these people will work on that feature jointly, all right, but they will also work in a different dimension with the other people relevant in their technology layer. So for example, if you're working on the domain model for a new feature, you collaborate within the feature team on that feature, but you will also work within an inner source team on making sure that whatever you add to the domain model makes sense for all the other users as well. Um, is that something you observed? Is that a, does that resolve any conflict between agile and inner source perhaps? I'm not sure if it resolves the conflict, but I think it's a good um, learning experience. Um, also, for the teams that try to contribute back to the open, to the inner source or open source projects, because if you then have this strong uh, maintainer team in place, you get challenged, obviously, very much on um, what you did, uh, how you did it, and why you did it. And that is uh, very healthy in my experience. Exactly. So, this uh, breaking of uh, constraints or taking a shortcut because a customer wants something fast is then um, basically where you run into a, a, a brick wall when you go back with that to the maintainer, uh, uh, which will say uh, this is totally, uh, will never get back into my uh, uh, tree. And if you do not do upstream integration, obviously then uh, inner or open source does not work at all. So I think it's a good learning experience. I think, at least for me personally, it's too early to say if it resolves the problem, but it definitely gives uh, clarity to the issue. Clarity to the issue. All right. Um, Max, I saw you gave me back the microphone. I also saw we had the time limit, but maybe there's time for a final question. Uh, sure, please go ahead. Uh, sure, please go ahead. All right, so I, it's actually a simple question. Uh, you focused on SAFE, I believe, um, and but there are other frameworks like LESS. Um, do you have an overview perhaps of uh, the benefits or strength of some of those? Maybe not every company is as big as Siemens maybe need something more lightweight. I don't know, are alternative frameworks also reasonable? Does it match somehow size of company or size of projects or products? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I really did not want to create the impression yeah, that SAFE is the yeah. only uh, valid framework, if that was uh, kind of what you perceived. Um, and actually I would say SAFE, is a framework for really large organizations. I would not use it if, if I would be mid-sized. And for example, if you have, let's say, I don't know, 50 people in a team, um, probably less as an example is the better framework. So I do not really have a detailed overview with me right now, but I'm sure you can find various studies. Um, in, in the end, it, uh, as all these organizational things, it's always a trade-off, right? I mean, we in the end um, decided we don't want to go with various frameworks because our experience is it makes it extremely difficult for people to even talk to each other. I know it always sounds silly, but if one uh, method calls uh, the largest um, uh, work item epic and the other calls it theme and the third one calls it feature, and then three people talk to each other and they will uh, kind of not understand uh, what they're talking about. So that's uh, something we wanted to avoid. And we also needed a framework that um, scales to really large systems, including hardware, and uh, that comes with uh, really uh, well uh, thought through um, uh, training and documentation concept. 
and that basically then um, uh, um, ended up in selecting safe. If, if you, if any of these uh, things are not so important for you, then I, I'm, I'm sure there are many options on the market. When I talk to people here in Switzerland and I talk to people like uh, Swisscom or many financial institutes, as you can imagine, um, I can say that SAFE is in the corporate world pretty much the standard. But again, if you are much smaller, um, then sure. I, I mean, I would probably take the one that is um, as lean as possible because again, um, everything that is not necessary just is a waste. Um, for the organization. For the organization. Yes, thank well, you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, well, Dirk Stockmann, thanks um, a lot. Let's give, um, a, virtual um, and, let's uh, give a virtual round of applause. And virtual round of I think this applause. concludes our session and, today. Thanks uh, a lot. I think this concludes our session today. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Yay. Yeah, thanks again for <laughs> the pleasure me. was all ours. <laughs> the pleasure was all ours.